Hi there, this is Dr. James Ware. I come to you from Authentic Biochemistry Studios on the 30th of August, 2020. We are having a slight modification of the lectures that we've been doing because I'm going to do a recognized sharpening of the lens and talk about a specific type of T-cell because it's come under scrutiny from lots of different biomedical publications recently and it fits perfectly in our discussion of aging. Remember, we're talking about aging. We're also taking as the contrarian to aging um, the aspect of tumor genesis, right? So we're still well into those lectures. And I know I've been doing several uh, as simply audio, and so I thought I should go ahead and do another video. So that's where we are. So um, let's get going with this. All right. So I'm going to call this innate like T-cells. Location and reception play a role in function. That's me, Dr. Dan Guerra. And both those uh, images you see there, one's a still and one's a movie. <clears throat> and you can see there's my email address. This is a publication from my Authentic Biochemistry Studios podcast, a video publication. So let's get right to the discussion here. Okay, from a paper published in the Journal of Experimental Medicine this year, recently, you can see there's the uh, link for it. I will just read what it says because we have a lot of information to get through. Brain, of course, is traditionally viewed as an immune privileged organ, which for all intents and purposes is an incorrect way of thinking of the central nervous system. It's not immune privileged, meaning that there are immune cells which traffic into the brain and of course, the microglia, which compose a tremendous amount of the central nervous system, are all indeed resident macrophages, and those have more like an innate immune cell. So it's not immune privilege by any means. At any rate, it used to be considered to be void of immune cells, save for those microglia and the parenchyma. <clears throat> and of course, uh, there may be a neuroprotective role for all of this for immune surveillance, which you might guess is going to be really important in CNS. But this paper talks about innate lymphocytic cells, ILCs, that we talked about way back when I was doing my um, acquired immunity responses related to um, diseases that, that can present as autoimmune diseases. For example, lupus and arthritis, right? So we talked about these ILCs before. Now we're going to do a really deep discussion of that uh, for purposes that you will hopefully see as we uh, drive through this lecture. So we're going to talk about innate lymphocytic cell mediation, and this is going to be occurring at the choroid plexus, and that maintains actually, according to this paper, uh, CNS integrity. So this paper looked at rag deficient mice lacking adaptive immune cells or mice deficient for T cells and they exhibited an impaired neurogenesis and declined cognitive function. It could be restored by the transfer of splenocytes, which of course are gonna be um, naive type cells from the lymphocytic uh, class, or in fact using CD4 positive T cells. An accelerated progression of Alzheimer's disease is observed in RAG2 minus interleukin-2 receptor minus mice that lack both an adaptive and an innate immune response, of course. Now that RAG, a brief mention there, I forget sometimes that I haven't talked about these things uh, in their entirety uh, lately. But RAG is, the, um, is, a, is a shortened term for region associated with genetic recombination. And the RAG genes are the ones that involve the recombination mechanism to generate the T cell receptor much like immunoglobulins, are the result of recombination. Right. So that's what the RAG, so if you have a RAG deficient mouse, you're not or a RAG deficient system, you're not able to make T cell receptors with the repertoire they have to be able to deal with all the potential antigens presented to them from antigen presenting cells. So 
it appears that Th2 cytokines, two of them here, in leukin-4 and leukin-13, preserve a spatial learning and memory by reducing inflammation and promoting neurogenesis. And T regulatory cells alleviate cognitive decline in at least murine AD model, Alzheimer's disease model. And that suggests the suppression of neuroinflammation is playing a role, right? Now, the immune surveillance is centered on the importance of circulating adaptive immune cells. Now, you, you're going to call them adaptive because they're part of the lymphocytic community, right? They have that kind of signature. What does that mean? Uh, with uh, the la They do lack a few things. These ILCs do lack cell surface receptor mediated antigen associated activation. But other than that, they have things in common like transcription factors and growth factors, and even the panoply of cytokines and chemokines that are generated. So that's why we can talk about innate uh, lymphocytic cells being in the family of the lymphocyte community, and therefore, essentially, at least um, upon cellular integrity and cellular identity, fall into the family of the acquired And it seems like they're working in the brain. Sorry about that. Now, a lot of writing, but don't worry about it. It's all extremely important. Innate lymphoid cells, I'm going to call ILCs, are specialized innate effector cells that lack clonally distributed antigen receptors, but transcriptional resemblance, I'm just repeating what I just said to you, at home. T cells with a subset 2 ILCs respond to the alarm protein in the leukin 33, which is And they're potent producers of two cytokines, IL 5 and IL 13. As we'll see, they also produce a couple of others. ILC 2s are non circulated tissue resident cells residing in non lymphoid tissues, such as the mucosal barriers. Move my head here. Uterus, adipose tissue, interestingly, and regional cell cycle progression. Okay. Linked proliferation is a signature of the ILC2 activation. Okay, regional cell cycle progression linked proliferation is a signature of these cells. See what I mean? Soon. Indeed, tissue resident ILC2s are implicated in tissue repair, tissue remodeling metabolic homeostasis, and indeed ILC2s were recently discovered in the dura sinus of the meninges in the mouse model. Okay. Meningeal resident ILC2s are activated during spinal cord injury and are involved in wound healing. However, whether ILC2s are found populating the uh, choroid plexus is not established. So their potential role in cognitive function responses to aging uh, were, and it still are even after this paper, unclear. At least they haven't been completely uh, decided in terms of however you get to decide in research, which means until another paper comes along and either supports what's been found or refutes or doesn't look at it. Right? This paper demonstrates accumulation of tissue residents ILC2s in the choroid plexus of the aged brain of mice and humans where they are maintained and capable of reversibly switching between cell cycle dormancy or mitotic division and therefore proliferation of cells. Now, they are relatively resistant to cellular senescence, which of course in the aging brain makes them a rare cellular population, and exhaustion, so that it's running out of ability to, to replicate and divide. So, even replication stress that's associated with late stage senescence does not seem to play a role in these ILC2s in the uh, central nervous system. That This all leads to enhanced self renewal capability, capacity. They are functionally quiescent in homeostasis, but they're reactivated once exogenous in a loop at 33. It's generated to produce large amounts, then ultimately of IL-5, which 
remember these cells make, and I offer them to you. Now, when activated in vitro and transferred intracerebroventricular ventricularly, or ICV, they revitalize aged brains. This is all mouse model stuff, and enhance cognitive function of aged mice. As much as you can believe that there's a cognitive function there, they could be extrapolated to what it's like in humans, which is a big if you can. Right? But anyway, administration of a liquid five, a major ILC2 product, repressed aging associated neuroinflammation. Now that's something that's indicative of aging, as we've been saying, and alleviated aging associated cognitive decline, which is something that has been um, modeled in the mouse. Results suggest that aging may expand a unique population of brain resident LC2s with an enhanced cellular thickness and the potent neuroprotective capability. Targeting LC2, therefore, in the aged brain could unlock therapies that combat age related neurodegenerative disorders such as. An accumulation of tissue residual C2s in that CP of age brains may be linked to diminished aging, associated, associated cognitive decline. ILC2 in the age brain are long lived, capable of switching between cell cycle dormancy and proliferation, as I said, resistance to cellular senescence and exhaustion of the replication stress. When activated in the feature of transfer of the age brain, they can drastically improve the cognitive function. I've said all that, right? Now, Together, targeting these ILCs, twos in the age of brain, again, is being suggested to provide a new avenue to combat not only AD, but perhaps brain aging. Now, I'm very, very, very hesitant to believe that we can make that statement, but that's what the authors are trying to say in this paper. Now, our data, their data, indicate that the effects of aging on immune cells are much more complicated than previously appreciated. Indeed, it's always more complicated than originally appreciated. That's how science works, particularly research science. Earlier work focused on heavily on the detrimental effects of aging on the immune system. And there's a term they use called immunosenescence. And it's a term that they merged to describe decline in the adaptive immune response and an increased susceptibility to infectious diseases with aging. You can see where that paper is published. Previously, senescence in immune cells was associated with compromised functional capability, decreased self renewal, that is, can't replicate any longer, and or increased secretion of destructive bone femtor side effects. Certainly don't want happening. Um, within the common course of events in the central nervous system. Now, this is a paper that published not now from Life Science 2020, January, that so recently, published, what, eight months ago now. That paper now, it's a different paper, demonstrated that interleukin-5 overexpression suppressed the development of acute aortic dissection, known as AAD, not to be confused with AD. This is about an aortic dissection, which is, of course, a surgical procedure. Um, and it does so by reducing inflammation and smooth muscle cell apoptosis, perhaps suggesting interleukin 5 is a potential therapeutic agent in this acute aortic dissection phenomenon, which can kill you. AD, indeed, what it is, is a tear in the inner layer of the large blood vessel branching off an aortic dissection is, of course, a medical emergency in which the inner layer of the large blood vessel branching up in the heart tears. It's most common in men in their 60s and 70s. So look out if you fall into that group. Now, another paper. So see, I'm bringing multiple papers in because we're talking about these ILCs. And I looked in the literature and see, we tried to determine where else are they discussed doing it authentic biochemistry, because that's what I do. Now, for a paper published in Circulation Research 2015, five years ago, this paper says it's adventitial 
chemokine CL1 granulocyte colony stimulating factor expression in response to AAD, right, that's the acute aortic dissection, triggers a local neutrophil recruitment and activation. That leads to adventitial inflammation via interleukin-6 and results in aortic expansion and indeed rupture and indeed good chance of mortality even in clinic in the hospital setting. You see where this is coming together. It was five years before, right? Five years before. So now we're looking at a totally different thing. Now we're looking at these ILCs maybe as being protective. One more paper to illustrate how you can go into the literature and find associated material so that you build a full focused description of what we know about ILCs in medicine. This is published in the Proceedings of Jap Japanese Academy um, series uh, B of Physiology, Biochemistry Sciences, or Physiological Bio uh, Biochemistry Sciences. That was in 2011, this was published so good nine years ago. Now, this paper is really important. Check this out. Classical characterization of IL-5 illuminated. See, now, now I'm looking, now, now I'm locking into IL-5, right? We talked about the ILCs. Got that. We know that ILC-2 makes IL-5. So I wanted to go back in the literature and find out what we know about IL-5. Sense is strictly. So. Characterization of IL-5 illuminates the ability to support the growth and terminal differentiation of B cells in vitro into plasma cell antibody secreting cells. Right? Okay, it's classically what we know about IL-5. IL-5 can actually target beta uh, B lymphocytes, plus eosinophils, so it has a major role there, and basophils, and likely glia, neurons, and muscle cells, like we've been saying. Right? Interleukin-5 is produced in both metabolic and non-metabolic cells, including T-cells, granulocytes, and of course the ILCs. IL-5 exerts its effect of proliferation differentiation via receptors, duh, that have an alpha and a beta subunit. The biological effects, therefore, of IL-5 are well characterized, using, looking at receptor-mediated binding of the ligand, and looking at the synophils activation. In fact, intravenous administration of a humanized anti-IL-5 monoclonal antibody reduced baseline bronchiomucosal lysonophil in asthma. So maybe antagonizing this system is suggestive for allergic diseases. So you see here, I just told you something good about our leukin-5, something neutral about our leukin-5, now something where we're trying to eliminate it, such as in allergic diseases. That's okay, my, my dog makes that noise on the wood floor because he sees a squirrel outside. Rocky, stop. Can't get that squirrel. On the next slide. Okay, there's a paper published in Nature. This is again building a repertoire of knowledge so we can discuss this uh, with, with full accompaniment, right? Paper published in Nature back in 2010. Very important paper. 10 years ago, 10 and a half years ago now. Natural killer cells, which I've talked a lot about previously, are important innate lymphocytes that unlike T and B lymphocytes, do not express the antigen receptors, but will rapidly exhibit a cytotoxic activity against, for example, virus infected cells. And of course they produce various types of cytokines and case. First report of a new type of innate lymphocyte, see where I'm going with this, present in a novel lymphoid structure associated with adipose tissue, I did mention this about 10 minutes ago, in the peritoneal cavity, they're terming, in, terming in this paper, FALC, fat associated lymphoid. <laughs> hey, hey, Rocky, stop, stop. Rocky, you make it difficult for me to be professional. So, C and then the, that particular uh, cluster, right? And it shows you then the genetic composition of it. So this Lin minus C kid positive, SCA1 positive makes these T lymphocytes, but not the kind 
that go that are antigen associated with presentation and recognizing that. That's what the Lynn minus means. Right? They are distinct lymphoid progenitors and lymphoid tissue inducer cells because they proliferate in response to interleukin two, which is to be a very powerful inflammatory cytokine. And they produce a large amount of Th2 cytokines, such as, and of course we know this, 5, 6, and 13. We already told you about 5. 6 and 13 also are very important being produced in the cell lineage. Now, IL-5 and IL-6 together with their own receptor cells regulate B cell antibody production, as I've said, and cell renewal of the B1 cells. I mean, it's replication there proliferation of cells. And they also enhance the production of IgA, right, immune globulin in A, which is a surveilling immunoglobulin. Whilst IL-5 and IL-13 mediate allergic inflammation, we just alluded to that with the asthma paper, and protection against human production. And th these, these authors propose that these cells should be called natural helper cells, as they decided to call them. But later, now, that is, currently, we call these ILC2. So see, this paper was the first paper to start characterizing this uh, lymphocyte. And they, they said, why don't we call them natural helper cells? Well, that didn't work out too well, because that natural word, they still wanted to get in there that it was innate like, you see. So that's why they're called innate like cells. Like, innate like cells, and of course, they're of the lymphocytic class. Because of the signature. Here's a paper published in Stat Pearls. Uh, this is just basically what you can go to. It's not the kind of paper that is. It's refereed, but it's not a research paper. It's just a paper that organizes information. This particular paper is going to talk about the neuroanatomy of the choroid plexus. You can see there's the hyperlink for it. Now, why am I doing this? Because I told you that these ILC2s are accumulating in the choroid plexus. So we need to review what that is. That's what we're doing. So the CNS choroid plexus is a complex network of capillaries surrounding specialized cells. Please write this down. Whose function it is, not is, is, it's simply it is, to generate cerebral spinal fluid via the epididymal cells that line the ventricles of the brain. The choroid plexus serves as the blood CSF barrier, where it's associated with excretion of growth factors associated with immature stem cells in the subventricular zone. Okay. Human brains compose, of course, of three layers of meninges, known as the dura mater, the erected mater, and the pia. Choroid plexus resides in the innermost layer of the meninges, which is the pia mater, which is close in close contact with the cerebral cortex and spinal cord. The CP then, the choroid plexus, lines all the ventricles of the brain except for the frontal occipital horn of the lateral ventricles and, of course, the cerebral aqueduct. Okay. It, 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 reminding you of your neuroanatomy. The choroid plexus has a lining of specialized epithelia, known as the ependyma, which are glia, not neurons, with a ciliated simple columnar form that line the ventricles and central canal of the spinal cord. So that's a little bit of neuron that. Now, let's do a little bit more. Neuroanatomy, actually more neurophysiology uh, than neuroanatomy, but that's okay. Both. Apical surfaces have a covering of cilia which circulate the CSF to keep that fluid dynamic flux. And they also have microvilli, which helps in CSF absorption, so two functions there. Where the microvilli perform this function via the brush border membrane, which significantly increases the surface area of the choroid plexus, permitting increased cerebrospinal fluid absorption. Epididymal cells secrete up to 500 <coughs> of CSF 
per day in the adult human brain. CSF cushions support the brain and the spinal cord, and they function as a filtration system to circulate nutrients and remove metabolic waste from the CMS. Rocky, please stop. The CSF flows to the third ventricle from the lateral ventricles via the right and left interventricular foramen of Monroe, continuing from the third to fourth ventricle via the cerebral aqueduct of Sylvia's. And finally, the CSF flows from the fourth ventricle to the subarachnoid space via the foramen of Magendi medially and via the foramen of Lushka laterally. Okay. Once the spinal fluid is in the subarachnoid space, it can be reabsorbed via the arachnoid granulations and ultimately drain into the dural venous sinus. Now that's, again, some physiology, some CMS physiology. Now because of CSF, pressure associates with brain development, too little of cerebrospinal fluid can stunt brain growth. Whereas overproduction of CSF, we call hydrocephalus, as in the CHP papilloma. Okay, now let's start getting into a little bit more detail of our um, lymphoid cells. They're complex and they can interconvert. This is from a paper published in uh, 2015 on March 31st, which just so happens to be someone's birthday. Yeah, whoops. The adaptive immune system arose late in evolution. It consists, of course, of the B and T lymphocytes that express recombining antigen-specific receptors so that RAG system in the T cell, right, for example, the B cell, of course, has the same kind of recombination method of the various subunits to make the immunoglobulins, which we covered sometime in the past. They're activated by their cognate antigen and secondary lymphoid organs, and they undergo significant cell division and differentiation before exerting their effective function. Of course, in contrast, innate lymphocytes topic of what we're at right now, display rapid effective functions. Despite their set of limited germline encoded receptors, for more than three decades, natural killer cells were the only recognized innate lymphocyte, which we just mentioned, right? And we showed you the, the primary canonical papers that, was get, that were getting us there, right? More recently, additional innate lymphocytes have been discovered and were considered to be part of a family of effector cells, collectively named innate lymphoid cells or LCs. LCs have a lymphoid morphology, they lack rearranged antigen receptors, as we were saying, and they are abundantly present in mucosal surfaces such as the enteric lamina. The expression of lineage specific transcription factors and discrete cytokine profiles leads to the identification of three distinct ILC subsets that have striking parallels to T helper cell subsets. The main ILCs are killer ILCs comprising natural killer cells, which we've been talking about already, and the helper-like ILCs, remember they were first called helper cells, remember, including ILC 1, 2, and 3. Group 1 resemble TH1 cells right, of that lineage, and they include natural killer cells and other interferon gamma-producing innate effectors. ILC uh, ones are shown to depend on TBX2, which is a T-box transcription factor, also known as TBAT. I talked about this quite extensively about uh, two months ago. And they're looking 7 and 15. Group 2 LLCs, the ones we've just been mentioning here, are like TH2 cells. And so ILC2s are ROAR, Alpha, Gamma, and GATA3 dependent. Now the ROAR alpha and the roar alpha gamma and the alpha beta those are transcription factors and the roar of course is the orphan retinoic acid orphan receptor dimer right, that we've talked about also quite extensively 
in our profiling of retinoic acid, which is, of course, a lipid uh, hormone. Uh, and GATA3, which is a, a protein dependent, that's a transcription factor. And you get ILC dependency, and they produce IL5 and IL13. We just said that, right? So you start here with a common helper like innate lymphoid cell, and you make a global ILC progenitor right here. That's the helper like innate lymphoid cell. Right? Uh, and there, and there, it, it produces a specific transcription factor called TOF. Then you can convert that to an ID2 positive NFIL3 uh, or an ID2, um, not sure what that says there. I think that might be a different isoform of ID2 as a transcription factor. Ultimately leading to ID2 PLZF plus, which is again, now we're, we're, we're differentiating these ILCs, right? To an ILCP and then finally we make either from the ID2 population or through that intermediate ILCP right here. All these cytotoxic ILCs, right? So you've got the natural killer cell up here with its own particular transcription factor, uh, ILC1. And these are all helper-like ILCs, as we just said. And then you have ILC2, which is expressing uh, use of transcription factor and expressing GATA3. And then the ROAR gamma, uh, gamma Ts. And uh, that's quick gamma, epsilon and gamma T for these ILC3 subclass. So you get the whole picture there for the air function. So ILC3s have gotten a little bit of play recently. So let's talk about them. This is from a paper published in Cell Death and Disease about a year ago. Well, I'm 10 or 15 ILC3s express a retinoic acid receptor related orphan receptor, that's the ROAR gamma T, and the signature cytokines IL22 and 17. Fetal ILC3s or lymphoid tissue inducer cells are required for lymphoid organogenesis, while postnatally developing ILC3s are important for the generation of intestinal crypto patches and isolated lymphoid follicles, as well as the defense against pathogens and epithelial homeostasis. That was all published in the European Journal of Immunology. So that's a bit of information preamble you need to understand the 2019 paper. You have group three innate lymphoid cells, the ILC3s, right? And they're responsible for GI mucosal homeostasis through a moderate generation of IL-22, 17, and GMCSF, right? All at it occurring in the physiological state. Now, ILC3s contribute to the progression and aggravation of inflammatory bowel diseases by the dysregulation of NCR, uh, that, that's a receptor, ILC3 or NCR positive ILC3s function and the bias of NCR positive ILC3s towards ILC1 under the stimulation of the 12 generated by CD14 positive dendritic cells presenting antigen, as well as regulatory ILC dysfunction in the pathological state. The dysregulation of ILC3 results in the overexpression of inflammatory cytokines 22, 17, and interferon gamma, in which an interleukin 17 can recruit neutrophil cells and then therefore generate neutrophil extracellular traps or nets we talked about recently, and they disrupt the epsilon or e cadherin and junctional adhesion molecule, like molecule, I don't like the name any more than you do, uh, J-A-M-L. And that leads to the enhancement of epithelial permeability, which of course is going to cause tissue damage, tissue destruction. So the ILC3 to ILC1 plasticity, which is just described there, is reversible in the presence of another cytokine, interleukin 23 and also in the presence of interleukin one beta and indeed retinoic acid produced by the CD14 dendritic cells. There's a lot of ways to repeal that conversion. Now here's a paper published in Frontiers of Immunology, which talks about T regulatory cells. Tregs, via their immune suppressive capability, play an indispensable role in maintaining immune homeostasis and preventing autoimmunity. 
be induced by excessive, misdirected, or unnecessary immune activation. This is the hallmark, right, of autoimmunity. Uh, or hyperimmunity, as I call it, which is another form of an immune response that goes way over to Mark. One is recognizing host cells, right, that it should, they shouldn't be recognized. And hyperimmunity can be recognizing any given antigen, a host cell antigen, or indeed an antigen produced by uh, a parasite or a bacteria or even a virus. So we get surface expressed cytotoxic T lymphocyte associated antigen 4, CTLA 4, and that mediates a suppression of the target cells by a cell cell content. Now, this is leading back into what? This is about uh, talking about how we use a CTL, uh, a 4 mediated response, and we try to then the ligand binding to your path, right? And those are the checkpoint inhibitor pathways in tumor therapy. Right? That one with PDL and PDL1. T reg cells can also reduce T cell activation proliferation, of course, through CD39, CD73, mediated production of a metabolic adenosine, while T reg cells also have been shown to harbor cytotoxic capacity and induce target cell apoptosis through release of granzymes A, B, and Anti-inflammatory cytokines that are secreted by T regulatory cells can also induce immune tolerance, that's what they call regulatory cells. Now, the pathological conditions, such as systemic lupus erythematosus, or SLE, and multiple sclerosis, MF, T reg cells exhibit plasticity to some extent and may actually start to mimic Unfortunately, T helper like phenotypes. So they no longer suppress the response. So we're gonna we're gonna finish this short video lecture by just introducing here how are T effector cells generated and regulated. This is a very, very long discussion. I want to break it up into two lectures. So this comes from a paper published in 2019, again, Experimental and Molecular Medicine, Volume 51, and the article number 18. So CD4 positive T cells play key roles in acquired lymphoid immunity by orchestrating cytokinesis, cytokinogenesis, excuse me, while differentiating into their mature cellular lineages, including TH1, 217 effector and or T regs via T cell receptor eat with the rag genes being required for that. Each CD4 lineage expresses a suite of unique transcription factors to drive their terminal differentiation. These include but are not limited to T fat, you find that in heavily expressed in T reg cells. Uh, and that's the transcription factor also for TH1 cells. And they go on to clear intracellular pathogens by inducing transcription of the interferon gamma gene. Similarly, Th2 cells express in the look at 4, 5, and 13. Uh oh, that's like the ILC2s. And notice Th2 cells, ILC2s, that's why they're given that subsignature 2 number. In response to Hellman's, use the transcription factor gamma 3 while TH17 cells express the word gamma 2. Right? This is, see how it's very similar to those ILCs we just talked about, right? They're conformers to the word gamma T as a lineage determining factor and produce the cytokines, of course, interleukin 17A because you have TH17 cells, interleukin 17F and interleukin 22 regimen to eliminate extracellular bacteria and also fungi. But there are dark sides of T-cell activation, including TH17, autoimmune-mediated multiple sclerosis, and rheumatoid arthritis, which are very powerfully uh, morbid and sometimes uh, leading to fatality, uh, autoimmune diseases. To control this overreach by the acquired immune lymphoid pathway, Another adaptive number two cell lineage that blocks, not blocky, the pro inflammatory drive R, of course, with T regs. Right? See, I'm trying to give you a synopsis here so we can go to detail next time. T regs 
typically, unless they de-differentiate. The Tregs tank differentiation and proliferation of all the effector cell lineages. Which ones? Th1, Th2, Th17, fourth and second. And they downregulate, Tregs downregulate inflammation unless they check autoimmunity, allergic responses, and also any place where you're getting an immune response where it's not supposed to be occurring. Down regulation. So I'm going to stop here because it's going to start getting into details of Treg uh, regulation, and I want you to understand this completely. It's going to be a key factor, and now we're going to put together the ILCs I just introduced to you. Right now, remember. The reason we brought up the ILC is the ILC2 class that was discovered in the subarachnoid space and in the choroid plexus. Remember, those cells that people didn't think could be there are there, and they're typically quiescent. But when they're activated, they actually seem to prevent neurodegeneration and enhance mental acuity in the murine model. Remember that? Now you might say, well, wait a minute, all this other stuff we heard about ILCs, even ILC class 2, and even our discussion of interleukin 5, and certainly interleukin 6 and interleukin 13, which are generated from that subclass of ILCs, sound like they could cause inflammation. Why would they cause inflammation in the CNS? And they do in, say, in the heart system we were talking about, the ADD, right? Uh, and even in generating the acinophil activation, causing problems in the lungs. Obviously, the reason for the difference occurs between the CNS and those other tissue types is because the receptors in the CNS are not going to be the same. Plus, what else don't you have in the CNS? You don't have a lot of circulating B cells, right? If you don't have a lot of circulating B cells, one of the major functions of interleukin 5 is to induce B cell to plasma cell antibody producing. Don't have B cells in the brain, so they can't do that. So this is a very good example of how you get tissue specificity and temporal differentiation, depending on which particular cell type you're talking about, as well as whether or not there are receptors for whatever's produced by that cell type. Without the receptors that are canonical for that cell type, the ILC2, they do not function as pro-inflammatory, but they act as neuro but protective. See how that works? Totally different system, yet embedded with the same cells and the same cytokines being generated. So when you say, oh, this interleukin, this particular IL is always pro inflammatory, you just don't have any reason to say that. You need a receptor that's going to work downstream to cause the inflammatory response. If you don't have that receptor, you don't have other cells that respond to that receptor mediated response. Voila, you don't get inflammation, you get neuroprotection. For example, with the ILC2. That's right. So that was a long discussion uh, at the end there, but hopefully you got something out of that. What I'm trying to get you to understand is that we can we can talk about all the papers that uh, we, we can spend the time on to discuss how cells are discovered, how they function, what they're characterized for. We look at brand new papers to see that they are being studied for tumors, for autoimmune diseases, uh, and also possibly as neuroprotective agents. For example, the CP paper we just looked at, murine model, maybe by eliminating or slowing down Alzheimer's disease. But we must always keep in mind that the cell lineages and what those cells produce in terms of pro-inflammatory or anti-inflammatory cytokines and chemokines. Uh, generating chemotaxis, and then the proliferation of other cell lineages, right? Trafficking of cell lineages to that inflammatory site or infection uh, site will not function the same in any given different tissue type. So much more um, florid and complex than simply trying to understand a given site of kind of chemo chemotaxis for being anti or pro inflammatory. All right. So that, dear 
friends is where I'm going to end today. And I'm going to get back to this discussion tomorrow because I'm going to go back and do um, revealing to you how TREG's work and how those helper cell functions work. And then we're going to put this back. We're going to target this right back and package it into our discussions of tumor genesis and aging. Okay, so this is all background information so that we can talk fluently because we'll have all of our terms described and defined before we start talking about this, these two major physiological states. One is a proliferation leading to cancer, and the other is the senescence leading to aging, both of which can lead, of course, to death. So, again, this is Dr. Dan Guerra uh, from Authentic Biochemistry on the 30th of August saying bye for